Dr. Herbert Stelton from San Antonio. I would like to tell Mrs. Oberhauser that biologically I am a grandfather. I expect to live to be a great-grandfather and maybe a great-great-grandfather. If this fellow doesn't quit shooting me, I'm not going to live long. For two days he's been at it. Now, I came up here fully expecting to talk to you on help from the kitchen out. And I get here and I discover I'm supposed to talk to you on duty. Uh, oh, we try to incorporate a little bit of both into the talk. Uh, at noon today, I had lunch with one of our mutual friends. I hope I'm not out of order in mentioning the name in this group, Mrs. Duncan. Uh, and we went to a hotel where we had a salad and nice avocado. But we got into something that uh, we didn't know about. Neither she knew of it nor I. We got into a fashion show. They were holding a fashion, fashion show in the dining room. So while sitting there eating, we had the pleasure of looking at the models and the dresses. And the who's and listening to the who's and the odds and that a beautiful dress. And they brought out one that they told us they hadn't been tagged yet for price. It looked like it was made of cotton. It looked like a, some Scotsman had been working on it because it was checked. And uh, it was supposed to be priced by somewhere around $500. Most of, the, most of the dresses were lower priced, and I said, I'll take it if you wrap it in gold foil. <coughs> A dress of that kind of that price should be wrapped in gold foil with diamond stud in the wrapper uh, to justify the price. But the point I want to bring up is that this is our idea of beauty. We just have a beautiful dress. <laughs> if we just have a beautiful dress. And then, of course, we can have it. Now, makeup really puts a mask on the face. A woman who is made up is wearing a mask. She doesn't look like herself. She looks like something else. There may be real beauty under that mask. There often is. But there isn't any beauty in the mask. Although she has been quite, quite been brainwashed into thinking that makeup gives her beauty. And uh, I have noticed that the older they get, the heavier coating of makeup they put on their faces, the more red red they add to their cheeks, and the whiter area they cover with the red, so that the mask looks worse and worse as they go along. A woman recently complained to me that in the beauty parlors, they're buying in coffee, coffee and with cigarettes. And she complained that in the beauty parlor, you're in a state of tension. Sit there under the hair dryer, or whatever, or whatever, or you, or you have your hair in, in the curler, curler with the electric electricity to run through them, and you're in a state of tension. tension. In the beauty parlor, everything that's there is antagonistic and beauty. beauty. Instead of, instead of fruits and vegetables, coffee and cigarettes, instead of relaxation, tension. Instead of exercise, you're sitting. You're in a closed room with electric lights. Now, what, she, what we need is exercise for our muscles and relaxation for the whole body. We need proper food, not poisoning. We need sunshine. A, a genuine beauty parlor would consist of a gymnasium with a, with a, with a sun bath, uh, with places to relax and rest, uh, with a dining room where you could be served uh, fruits and vegetables. And, and these are not what we have in our beauty parlor. These are things, however, we can have 
more or less, in our home. Of course, if you've been living in a large city and you occupy an apartment, there isn't much opportunity of having all of these various rooms and compartments where you have a sun bath, where you have a relaxing room, and where you have a gymnasium. Uh, but it is possible to have your exercise in your own home. You don't have to belong to the YMCA or the YWCA or to, to a health club that has a gymnasium in order to take your exercise. Uh, it is possible to take exercise right in the home. The heart of the home is the kitchen and the dining room. Here is where the very basic elements of living are prepared and served. And here is where you can have the fruits and the vegetables that are so essential to elasticity and freshness of tissue, so essential to clearness of the eyes and of the skin. I, I could name for you, and I'm not going to do it, a little girl whom some of you know. She doesn't live in Chicago, but you've seen her at some of the conven hygienic conventions that you have attended. Uh, she is the oldest in the family of children. And while they are hygienics, hygienists theoretically, they're like too many other hygienists. They know about it and they talk about it, even rave about it, but they don't live it. And last summer, I visited the family. <laughs> and went in company with others. <clears throat> we drove up to where they were, and uh, this oldest girl had a face full of pimples. She was very much concerned about them. And she talked the matter over with one of the ladies in our group, and the young lady said, well, why don't you, why don't you change your diet? Why don't you start eating more fruits and vegetables? And why don't you cut out this, that, and the other that she found the young lady was eating? And she said, well, do you think that would help? So she said, yes, I'm sure it would help. About three months passed, and this family came to San Antonio. And the little girl's face was as clear as any face you ever saw. Not a pimple, not a blotch. Beautiful, clear skin. Just by that change in diet. That's all the change that had been made in her mode of living. Just changed her diet. She had gone on her all raw fruit and vegetable diet. And she was staying with it. The results were so dramatic that the other kids in the family had it taken to it. <coughs> the time, the, these children had all been over, underweight all along. They had all gained weight on the raw foods. And two or three of them had gained a little too much. But they all had beautiful, clear complexion. And none of them had any pimples. Now, this girl, the oldest one, was just in that age when pimples are quite common. Acne, as they call it. And it's supposed to come with puberty and last through adolescence and then disappear. There's nothing you can do about it. You go to your skin specialist and he'll give you x-ray treatments or he'll give you some salve to put on there. He'll treat you in various ways, but he'll uh, suppress the pimples and just as soon as you stop using the salve, they bob right out again. And you can suppress them, and then they come out again. And sometimes your suppressive efforts don't help. But you can change the inside of the body, and, and you don't have to suppress them. They just cease automatically. You have a nice, clear skin without those pimples. Now, <clears throat> the condition of the skin depends, to a limited extent, upon the external, its external contact. Sunshine can be used to improve the condition of the skin, or it can be used to cause the skin to deteriorate. Too much sunshine. And a lot of, many of us do go out and get sun baths, and we overdo it. I've seen people take sun baths until their skin was looked like leather, and old leather at that, cracked and parched, and when you could, you could run your fingernail down it and leave a white streak like you'd marked it with chalk. Too much sunshine in these cases. It, too much of anything is evil. No matter how good it is in its normal amounts, it becomes evil. It becomes hurtful. We, we need to learn in whatever we do to exercise restraint and to practice the golden rule of moderation. And this is excellent 
in, ev in everything that we do for our health, for our beauty, or what, whatever we are doing it for, to be moderate in those things. <coughs> so, with our eating, if the thing is good, it does not become doubly good by eating twice as much. This is one of the mistakes that are made that is made by the people who feed us on juices. They won't put us on a fast if we're sick. They want us to eat juice. And they figure that, well, if a glass of juice is good, then a gallon of juice must be several times as good. And I once watched Paul Bragg. I'm sure some of you have heard him talk at some time or other. I once watched him drink a whole gallon of orange juice during the course of one evening's lecture. How much he had taken during the, during the day, I do not know, uh, in addition to that. But one gallon in the course of one lecture. Now, this is a ridiculous practice. It was a ridiculous example for the man to offer to the people to whom he was talking. It is one of the ways that we run into a lot of trouble. We think a thing is good, let's get all of it that we can so we get as much good out of it as possible. very much like finding that when you're cold, uh, that you get close to the stove and you get warm and the warmth feels good, and you say, well, I'm going to have plenty of that. So you back up against the stove and burn yourself. It's the same thing, exactly. It's, too, it's just a little too much warm. Too much food, too much sunshine, uh, too much, even too much of exercise. We can overdo exercise, but most of us underdo it. Many of us complain that we are overworked when we could do three or four times as much work as we're doing with perfect benefit to ourselves. Our overwork is not usually the kind of overwork we like to talk about. Overdoing things is injurious. So when we go into the kitchen, let's go in there with the idea uh, that we're going to be moderate in our indulgence. I, I mean in the dining room. The, the kitchen is where it's prepared, and the dining room is where we usually overfill with it. Now we had at noon today, we had a salad of lettuce and celery and tomatoes and an avocado. That constituted my meal. Uh, I'm eating very lightly on this trip because I find when I do a lot of talking, uh, my throat gives me a little trouble and if I eat very lightly, I get along better with with, light, with my talking. Now, I'm going to have a lot of, lot, of, uh, lot of lectures to give on this tour. Four here in two days. In New York, it's going to be still worse. Besides all the traveling, there isn't a lot of time for rest. Uh, so, sometimes in some of these jumps are so close together that there's no time to even brush your teeth between jumps. So it's necessary to eat lightly. The common thought is that if you've got to do a lot of work, you want to eat a lot because you need the energy. Now that is not a correct view of life. Uh, if you want, if you have a lot of work to do then wait till the work is over to do the heavy eating. It must be heavy eating. Because while you're doing the work, you don't have the digestive power to handle a lot of food. So when we go into the dining room, let's keep this in mind. Light eating, when we're active. Light eating, it's light eating if we have a lot of physical work or a lot of mental work to accomplish. And then after a period of rest and relaxation, and a, a preceding a time when we're not going to have to do a lot of work, then have our heavy meal. So that we don't go into the dining room for in, the, at mor in the morning and try to have a big breakfast of a lot of fruits and a lot of vegetables and things of that kind with the idea that fruits and vegetables are going to do thus and so forth. Now keep this thing in mind. There are no curative virtues in food. Somebody comes along and tells you, well, now spinach is good for that particular trouble, and arsenic, not arsenic, but celery is good for this particular trouble. Arsenic cures all your troubles if you get a large enough dose. <coughs> there are no curative virtues in food, and you do not derive benefit from food in proportion to the amount that you eat, but in proportion to the amount that you digest and assimilate. And if you eat more than you can digest and assimilate, then you do not derive any benefit from that excess. On the contrary, it constitutes a burden for you, and that burden must be handled by your body at the expense of its energies. 
And often it has some of it has to be thrown out through the skin at the expense of your your ego. You develop an inferiority complex because you've got skin eruption. Don't try to remedy troubles by eating foods. Rather, try to remedy them by eating less food. I remember once a young man who was on the air in Dallas, Texas. He had a program there, and he developed a trouble, and he immediately called me on the telephone and asked me what he should do, and he says, I can't fast. I'm too busy. I can't take time out. What can I do? So I explained to him how he should eat. Well, shortly after that, I received a letter from him from Milwaukee. He had gone to Milwaukee, and he was uh, had a program there. And he said, I'm following your advice, but I'm not making any progress. And I'm eating salads by the tubful. And I wrote back to him and I said, try taking your salads by the thimbleful. So after a couple of weeks, I got a letter from him saying, well, I, I followed your advice. I started eating less and I'm making progress. The idea he had in mind is that if these salads are good for us, and they'll help me in this particular condition, then I've got to eat a lot of salad. So he was eating, overeating on the things, as a matter of fact. I had another young fellow in New York, his mother brought him in to me, and uh, I had him on a short fast, in which time he made a certain amount of progress. And then I gave him a, a dietary program to carry out, and uh, after a considerable time, he con consented coming in, and he kept cutting, saying, telling me that he was eating just as I, had prescribed and so forth, why, and he still wasn't getting any, and along his mother came back with him. This was after several weeks, and I said to the mother, now there's something wrong here. This young fellow assured me that he's eating just as I have prescribed for him, and yet he's not making any progress. She said, Dr. Shelton, it, he's eating just as you told him, except for one thing. He's eating everything that you prescribed for him, and just as the way you prescribed him, except he takes nine take nine tomatoes at a meal. That was in addition to the rest of his salad. He was eating tomatoes, uh, which I had in his diet, but uh, and every other things were being eating and eaten in similar proportion. He was taking the diet, but he was taking enough for the whole family and part of the family next door. So he wasn't making any progress. Well, I I got him into the office then, and I had a good fatherly talk with him, and I explained to him just what he was doing with for himself. And I said, now you cut this down to the proportions that I told you to take, and then you're going to get start getting well. And he did, with the result uh, that we got recovery in a reasonable time from that time on. <clears throat> we do not, again, we do not get value from our food in proportion to the amount we eat, but in proportion to the amount that we digest and assimilate. Overeating, as in these two cases, proves harmful, even if it's the best of food, eaten under the best of circumstances, in the finest of combinations, it's still harmful. Well, let us keep in mind that if we want muddy complexions, if we want pimples on our faces, if we want blotches, if we want a haggard look, if we want lines and wrinkles, then let's just keep on overeating and overeating on the best of food. It is amazing how little food we actually need to keep up our strength and our weight and our energy and our feeling of well-being and how much of how many of us actually overeat thinking that we're eating moderately. Now I know a young lady and I've been struggling with her for six years trying to keep her weight down. She maintains a, a very beautiful figure, but she does have a, a, a tendency to put on weight. And she, every once in a while, she discovers that she's got to do a little reducing. All right, I, I can put her on orange juice, and uh, or I can put her on a fast, and she'll lose weight. But in the summertime, if you give her one slice of melon, she puts on weight. She puts on weight on very little. And she maintains strength and energy on it. Now, she's an unusual one, unusual individual in that she puts on weight on, on such a small amount of food. But all of us 
eat more food than we need. Almost all the time, almost every day, we eat more food than we actually need. And we pay for it in, in uh, impaired health, in skin blotches, and other ways that detract from our beauty. Now, in the kitchen is the place where the foods are prepared. And here it is that they, the one who does the preparing of food should give attention to what he or she is doing. Because foods can be, the best of foods can be quickly spoiled by mishandling in the kitchen. One of our prominent methods of dealing with our food today is that of blending it. We have these machines that we put the foods in there and we turn on the thing, it's got the electric motor and it's got a little sharp, a series of sharp knives that turn around at a rapid rate and they cut the food up into the, almost make, make the food into a soup, a puree. It makes it very easy to eat, especially if we don't have good teeth. We mix them this way and that, blend them together, one with the other, and we eat. So now we oxidize our food that way. And if we let them stand for just a few minutes after we blend them, enough oxidation has taken place that we get food that don't even taste like what we started out with. If you grind up a stalk of celery that way, for example, it doesn't taste like celery. It doesn't look like celery. And it, it loses through oxidation much of its food value. Grating carrots, cutting them up in small pieces. Now last night, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, throw any aspersions on our on our friend over here who prepared that meal or supervised the preparation of it, but last night we had carrots that had been cut up into small pieces, and they were drowning in water. At my place, I would never think of preparing carrots that way or serving them that way. I brush the carrots, clean them with a brush, leave them whole, don't break the skin, and cook them whole so that I can serve as much as possible everything in those carrots and they have they taste like something when they when they're prepared in that way when they're cut up in this way the taste is all gone the food value is largely gone uh, this is not criticism this is advice i'm giving you let us prepare our foods in such a way that we conserve their food values in every way possible whether we're going to eat them raw or cooked we must handle them in such a way that we conserve their food values now when you grate your beets you like to make salads with grated beets and grated carrots on them. You simply oxidize your beets and your carrots, and you lose value. And every other food that you handle in that way, you lose food values, you lose vitamins. You can run a, a head of lettuce through a food, a food chopper, and in one minute, you lose 70% of the vitamin C in that, in that, uh, lettuce just from oxidation. You peel an apple and you cut it in small pieces. You put it on a dish. In two or three minutes you look over there and it's turned brown. Not only comes soft, changed color, and changed in taste, but it's lost food value from the oxidation that takes place. I serve tomatoes at my place. I serve them whole. I never slice tomatoes. What we got at the, at the hotel a while ago uh, was sliced. We asked for whole avocados, they brought them out sliced. <clears throat> we said, bring them out and let us cut them ourselves. Well, they didn't, they brought them out sliced. Now, this exposing of our food to the inner portions of our food to oxygen means oxidation and means lo a loss of food value. It means a loss of taste. They don't taste as good. They don't taste the same. You'll enjoy your food better if you can eat them whole. Whether you, eat, whether you cook them, if I cook a turnip, and we do steam turnips, we scrub it with a brush, and we cook. We buy the small turnips. We don't buy big turnips. I heard somebody here yesterday saying that he, he to be sure that he gets Idaho potatoes, he sends he orders them from Idaho and has them shipped to us. Well, now how we love these big potatoes. You can't bake an Idaho potato that size and do a good job of it. I buy potatoes the way I buy carrots and turnips, beets and other things of that kind. I buy the small one to get an egg-sized potato. An egg-sized potato will give you can bake it nicely without burning one side of it and having the other side raw. 
of the inside raw and the outside burn. It's a, it's a much more tasty potato if it's a small potato that you bake than it is a large one. I have never tried to bake one of those large ones, but I've tried to eat them after they've baked out. In New York, they like to serve them in the, in the restaurants there, and I've never found one that I could relish because they don't bake well. We need to learn a few little simple things, and I can't go into a whole afternoon of cooking and food preparation here this afternoon, and I'm going to depart from my usual, from my usual rule. I, I almost never recommend my books They're hard enough for me to read without you having to read them. <coughs> but I, that volume two back there on the table on food does contain a lengthy chapter on food preparation that would be helpful to you in preparing your foods. Uh, there's some, some uh, information about food preparation in the book on beauty. But food is only one element in beauty building, so the most of the book deals with beauty itself, the elements of beauty, and how the cultivation of beauty, it, it deals with exercise, it deals with fasting, it deals with sunbathing, it deals with bathing, uh, it deals with sunshine, sunbathing, uh, and uh, so on. It deals with all of the elements of living that are requisite to, the, to building and maintaining good health, which is the basis of beauty. Now, no amount of health can make a beautiful person out of one who is not beautiful. And most of us are born ugly. Uh, the human race at, in its present condition is a race of cartoons and caricatures. We are not human beings in any high sense of the term. And it's not possible for us by any, pro any program of hygienic living to convert these cartoons and caricatures and the beauties, whether they're males or females. But we can at least improve upon them and make them better, and we can, I, I think we can get at least a certain percentage of our women away from the masks and away from dependence upon rouge and lipstick, and things of that kind, to give them what they think is beauty. And why they think it's beauty, I don't know. <clears throat> I know a young lady who says, I don't use anything but lipstick, but I feel nude if I don't have my lipstick. Now this is purely a matter of conditioning, not that you need, need lipstick to feel that you're well dressed. <laughs> it's just that you've been using it so long that you just miss it when you, when you leave it off. And yet that young lady looks far better, in my eyes, without the lipstick than she does with it. When she puts on the lipstick, she actually looks like a different individual. And it's not nearly, she is not nearly the same individual in, in appearance to me when she has the lipstick on as when she has it off. And I think that uh, that's true of most males. I find that when we go around among a group of males, wherever they're congregated, one of the chief butts of their jests is women's makeup. They all, <laughs> they all seem to be agreed uh, that it doesn't beautify them. And yet they tolerate it because, uh, well, that's the only kind of women there are, made up ones. Unless you get into a, a, uh, an Adventist church where you find the girls don't use makeup, you, that's about all you find. And there's no beauty in it. Besides not being beautiful, let me tell you a story. I said to a young lady a few years ago who used makeup, first place, she used it in a professional way in her work, and then she gave up that work, and she no longer had to resort to stage makeup, and uh, she was just using ordinary street makeup, and she wasn't using much of that. She was one of those who thought, well, it's better to just use a little bit. It's more natural. Now, I don't know why more natural is. Using a little is more natural than using more. Uh, I, I agree with the man, the physical director, who said that a, that a red lips made up of lipstick looks just exactly like a mouthful of tobacco to him. <clears throat> but anyhow, I, I said to her, now look at your skin. A few years ago, you were a young girl. You're still a young girl. 
but you had a beautiful, clear complexion. You had pink cheeks. You had pink lips. Lips are not normally red. They're pink. Imagine seeing a Negro girl going along with red lips. You see them. Now take the lipstick off and see what the color their lips are. They're black. They got black lips, but they've got they use the red lipstick just because they're supposed the lips are supposed to be red. And not even the lips of the white race are red. They're pink. Well, at any rate, I said, now you had a you had a beautiful complexion. I remember you when you were only 18 years old. You had a beautiful complexion. And now when you take off your makeup, what have you got? A sallow complexion. Sallow. Now, why do you think you have a sallow complexion? You've got good health. You're living sensibly. Why is your complexion sallow? Well, I don't know. I, I puzzled. I said, I'll tell you why it's sallow. Your skin has been injured by makeup, powder, and rouge. You've been drugging your skin. You've drugged it until it hasn't any life in it. Now dr cut it out. And let's see what happens. Within three months after she stopped using makeup, you could see a marked change in the condition of that skin. It took on life. It began to develop color. And today, although she is 32 years of age, the complexion is almost as beautiful as it was at the age of 18. She's not using any makeup. This makeup not only doesn't make you beautiful, it detracts from the beauty that you already have. <clears throat> if you want a beautiful skin, you have to be beautify it from within. It's good blood that makes beautiful skin. Blood is the only skin food. It is the only substance that the cells of the skin can take up and utilize in building more cells skin cells. You cannot feed the skin from without. There is nothing you can smear on your face that will feed it, but it's, it's fed by blood, and the condition of that blood determines the condition of your skin, providing you don't muss it up from the outside, which also injures your skin. I, I'm old enough to remember the time when women didn't use much makeup. Makeup as we know it today, is a post-World War I phenomenon. A few women used makeup before World War I, <clears throat> but very few. And I can remember that we had women that were 40 and 50 and sometimes 60 and 70 years old in those days that still had beautiful skins. Hair as white as cotton. Skins as soft and smooth transparent almost as that when they, as when they were young children. Sometimes there were some wrinkles in their face, but still the skin looked good. But you don't see that anymore, because we are spoiling our skins with this makeup. <coughs> oh, they used little harmless things <laughs> in those days to clean their skins with cucumbers and, and egg white and <laughs> that kind. But these washed off with water and didn't leave any chemical uh, damages to the skin, such as we're doing with our chemical substances that we use nowadays for makeup. <clears throat> the, the makeup industry, the cosmetic industry, is a rather recent development, and by high-pressure advertising, by all the women's magazines carry articles by a supposed expert, so that you're brainwashed all the time about the value of this makeup, the value of that one what you must do to have used this for your skin, your nails, your hair, and so on and so forth, which one is stylish and which one is not, which one is most becoming to this particular personality and which one is most becoming to that personality. You get all of that in your women's magazines, you get it in the women's pages of your newspapers, besides the advertising that you get, so that you're constantly being brainwashed into the idea that to be beautiful, you must be artificial. And the more artificial, the more beautiful. Now, to really be beautiful, you've got to be natural. But I'm not beautiful. I'm ugly. I've had more than one girl say to me, "I'm ugly." You, uh, I, I could, I, I can't be beautiful. Well, of course you can't. Ugly people can't be beautiful. No, 
But, and no matter how much stuff they put on their faces to try to reform and remodel those faces, they're still ugly. They don't, those things do not make ugly people beautiful and they certainly detract from the beauty of the beautiful person. And that's what I wanted to say a while ago when I said the human race has gotten itself into a miserable condition. We're such a botched lot that we are not, we are hardly classifiable as human beings anymore. I don't know how to classify us. We, we, we belong to some kind of a, of a race that's somewhere between man and uh, the ape. The real man and the real woman is yet to be uh, in the future, if we ever get sense enough to begin to retrace our steps. I think that once upon a time there were men and women on the earth. I think once upon a time the, the, what we call the human race was made up of real men and women. But nowadays, as to say, we are cartoons and caricatures, and one of the chief causes of that is our unhygienic way of life. But that is not the part that is hereditary. The, one, the chief cause of our botched condition that is hereditary is our mixed state of affairs. There's nothing like crossbreeding to produce organisms that are all distorted and out of shape. And we've done it. We are a nation of mongrels. We not remind me of nothing more than a chicken yard full of dunghills. Uh, no, go into the average home. If there's more than three children in a home, you can't find two of them that you could recognize as brother and sister. They're so different. There's no standardization of, it, of us anymore. We're, we're not. We're not Swedes. We are not uh, Scotsmen. We are not Englishmen, we are not uh, Germans, we are not Italians, we are not Greeks. We are just a mixture of everything. With the result that we, I remember once seeing a little girl, two little girls. They were at the railway station waiting for a train. The mother and father was with them. The mother was a rather nice, beautiful woman. The father was a handsome kind of a fellow except for one thing. He had a, a Jimmy Durante nose that stuck, stuck right out in the middle of his face. And here were two little girls that had all the beauty of that mother. Beautiful little girls, except they had their daddy's nose. Jimmy Durante noses that stuck right out in the middle of their face. Now, this, this fact of independent inheritance is something we are completely overlooking and consistently overlooking in our choice of a mate, in our classic practices. We are so mixed up physically uh, that we are actually at war with ourselves internally. We are constantly at war with ourselves. You know, you study, you study anatomy and you discover that there are actually people that are missing, lacking in certain muscles in the body. They're born without those muscles being present. Or they're born with one part of the body too big for the other parts of the body. In, in northern Norway, for example, where the, where the Norwegians and the Laps come together, they, sometimes they intermarry. And the offspring of these intermarriages of Laps and Norwegians have such small pancreases that they develop diabetes rather early in life. In other parts of the world, you see where they, uh, they cross these the head of the femur, which is the thigh bone, that little round head that goes into what we call the acetabulum, which is a socket in which it sits there, the head of the femur is too large for the, for the acetabulum, so you've got what they know as hip joint disease. The, the, the uh, head is out of the socket. You can't get it in there because it's too large. All as a consequence of crossing one race with another, one people with another, so that you get independent inheritance of one part. Sometimes you get pa patients, people whose hearts are too small for the size of the body, or their heart must may, may be much larger than the size of the body would, would require, or the circulatory system is too small for the body, or you get a man that's he's a good, uh, he's got a, he's got a nice physique, he's got a handsome, he looks handsome in every way except feet are too big. He's inherited big feet from his dad and the rest of them come from some other source. 
this business of crossing us up uh, that's been going on so long, and I'm not talking about you, you people in particular, all of us. I, I, I happen to be the result of a lot of crossing between the Scotch and the Irish and the German and the English myself. <coughs> uh, maybe that's the reason I'm as ugly as I am. At any rate, this has been going on so long that to find a beautiful person among us now is a rarity. And to find a beautiful person who gives birth to beautiful children is an even greater rarity. Whereas beauty should be passed down from one generation to the next. You marry a beautiful woman thinking, well, now I've got a fine specimen. I'm, my children are going to be fine children. I remember a young girl that I was very much smitten with when I was a little in high school. And uh, I thought she was a very beautiful girl. I still think she was. Time passed, she married somebody else. Uh, she moved away from my hometown just just before the outbreak of World War I. During World War II, her husband was a colonel in the army, and during World War II, they settled in San Antonio. And uh, I came in back in contact with her, and she had two little girls. They didn't have any of the beauty of the mother, none whatsoever. Her sister has three children, and there's none of the family beauty in those three children. You just can't tell today when you marry somebody what kind of an inheritance you're going to, your children are going to have because we're so crossed up and so mixed up that we, I know that if I buy white legger and hens, and a white legger and rooster, and I, that my chickens are going to be white legger, and I know that I'm going to have a flock of beautiful chickens. But when I go out to pick a wife, and I think, well, now this this is a fine specimen. Uh, this is going to be the mother of some beautiful children. When the children are born, you don't, you find that you have been badly mistaken because you don't have a standard product to work with. You have a bunch of mongrels. That's one of our troubles today, something that can be overcome if we ever wake up to what we are doing to ourselves. Now, I've considered this somewhat in this book on beauty. I've gone into it in great detail, as I intend to do, in a forthcoming book on the normal man. Uh, I uh, have been spending years working up this, work, this book on the normal man, and I'm not yet ready to begin to put it together and put it into shape to turn it over to the printer, because it's, it's an enormous subject. It has required tremendous amount of research, and I'm not fully satisfied with the amount of research I've done. I want to do some more on it before I begin putting it into shape for the printer, but I'm going to deal with it even more fully, uh, this particular phrase of the subject, in that work on the normal man. A uh, normal man, by the way, you know the old saying, man embraces woman. Normal man will include both sexes. <clears throat> I, we can't undo by hygiene what we've already undone by our genetic irresponsibility. Uh, but we can do much towards maintaining the health of what we have maintaining the integrity of what we've got and maintaining or even improving the appearance of what we have. We cannot do this by artificial means. We cannot do it. We've got to have something that has a relation to life. We've got to have a beauty building program that deals with the elements of life, something that is vital, something that is a living necessity. It's true enough that you can have a plastic surgeon remodel your nose. Of course, you may get hot and melt and be worse than ever. <laughs> After he handles it, he can do this. But you can't take have plastic surgeons remodel your whole body. Many of you have much larger face on one side than on the other. Have you ever studied yourself in the mirror and noticed how one-sided your face is? And did you ever stop to think that this is because you've used one side of your face to almost exclusively and developed that side? 
You do all your chewing on one side. When you talk, you talk on one side of the mouth. When you laugh, you pull one side over to the one side of the face over, and the other side doesn't laugh as much as one side. You haven't done. You haven't lived proportionately. I mean, symmetrically. You haven't behaved symmetrically. So you're one-sided as a consequence of one-sided development. You go out. You take your clothes off, or, or you put on a bathing suit. A short. You walk down the street, and people look at you and say, "Gee, look at that left leg. It's half the size of the right one." many of you ever noticed how much larger one leg is than the other? And it's because you have asymmetrically developed yourself by using one side more than the other. Did you ever watch a man playing baseball? He, he's a right-handed pitcher, perhaps, and he throws all of his balls with that right hand. He never uses his left. What is left? 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 Well, the right ha arm the right shoulder, the right side of the body gets all the activity, it gets all the development, the other side is neglected. Our, all, of our all of our activities are of that kind. All of our athletic activities are one-sided. All of our work is one-sided and lopsided. So we grow up and develop into lopsided and one-sided beings. We need, in order to offset that, we need a system of physical education that will take care of the neglected parts of our body that will give all of our body adequate exercise in order that we may develop symmetrically and proportionately. You see, a gymnast, he gets up on his trapeze there and he swings about and he does many marvelous things, but you look at him, he's got big broad shoulders and large well-developed arms and from the waist down, he looks like an ordinary man on the street. No development, because those parts of the body are neglected in his work. Your football player, he has large, well-developed legs and thighs, but the rest of them are not very, very well-developed because it's the legs and thighs that are most used in his football work. And in all of our activities, you take the, uh, the man at the, at the bench, he humps over. He may be working there in a good position. He tends to grow into that good position. We tend to assume the positions that we, ass that we maintain, uh, we assume to maintain the positions that we assume in activity. Uh, the farmer over the plow is home over. The painter is home over the field. We start this at school in the classroom. Our children may be nice, straight, like little Indians when they enter school. They're not in there a couple of years until they're too beginning to be stooped shoulders and have crooked spines because they're sitting at a desk all the time and sitting in faulty positions. We do nothing to counteract it. We give a child a scooter and put it on the right foot on the One gift is being thrown higher than the other. We develop curved spines and we, we develop a distorted body by that kind of activity. Instead of making the child use the scooter for a while on one side and the scooter for a while on the other side, we let it do it all on one side. We take off in jumping with one foot, all the, always the same foot. I remember once when I, during World War I, I met a man, he was, he was a photographer and his wife was an invalid. And he, had, he didn't, wasn't making enough money to take care of an office and, and a maid and so forth and so on. So he, he put the, he had his office in his home. He, he did all of his work in his home, except he took his, he took his uh, cameras and equipment and so forth. And he went from home to home. He'd make the pictures in the home, take them home and develop them. So he could look after his wife. And uh, he was developing a curvature of the spine. And he asked me about it, and I, I asked him, I said, how are you carrying your, your carrying case, your camera and so forth? Always on one side. I said, turn them over on the other side a while, and after you have corrected the condition, then learn to use them on both sides, one for a while, then the other. Well, he managed that way to remedy his curvature that he was developing by this one-sided activity. Our whole life in civilized civilization is so one-sided and so lopsided that we develop into all kinds of shapes and distortions and deformities. Just as we ruin our feet with our shoes, man was, man normally should go barefooted. We don't. As a matter of fact, although I grew up in a time when kids, kids all went barefooted, and I, I went barefooted until I was 15 years old. Nowadays, we don't let children go barefooted from, their, from infancy on up. We're, well, we're ashamed of their bare feet or something of the kind. We start ruining their feet very early. You go into the shoe store and the shoe man says, uh, 
Well, the little child should have arch supports. If it doesn't, it's going to have flat feet. There's no surer way of producing flat feet than breaking down this arch by using arch supports when it's young. And stiff foot along with it. The normal human foot is a bare foot, and it doesn't injure the arch of the foot to go barefooted. The best arches in the world are in those tribes of people who go barefooted all their lives and never wear a shoe at any time. Well, they also have good teeth, not because they go barefooted, and they never never see a toothbrush and toothpaste. They have good teeth because they have good nutrition. Teeth, good teeth depends upon good nutrition, not upon scrubbing the outside. Now, that's not to say that the teeth should not be kept clean. It merely means that cleaning your teeth is not saving your teeth. We, we use more toothbrushes than any other ten nations in the world combined. We have more tooth troubles than any other nation in the world. Just cleaning our teeth, brushing our teeth, not saving our teeth. Now, <clears throat> you're not going to save your teeth by using any of the best advertised toothpaste where uh, investigations in five dental colleges have shown such and such to be true. Now, you may be sure that the investigations were never made in the dental colleges, or if they were, they were made because they were paid for and the findings were what were, they were paid to find. The fact is that these things do not save your teeth, and they will not save your beauty in that sense. You want clean teeth to be beautiful. But at the same time, if you do not have proper nutrition, that scrubbing and brushing of your teeth will not save them. In the same way, arch supports will not save the arch of your feet. We do not save ourselves by resort to arts of any kind. Artificial means are not helpful. Just as, just as the, as the uh, chemicals that you put on your faces, and after all, made up face is only a dirty face. It's, ama it's amazing how the writers of works on beauty will tell you how to, all the, all the ritual that you have to go through to clean your face. They give you the ritual, just how to do this and how to do that. You do one thing and then you follow it with another and then you follow it. And finally you get your face clean or you're supposed to. And just as soon as you get it clean, then you start mussing it up again. By the time you get through, you've still got a dirty face. But just as that dirt that you put on your face, and it's usually quite a bit of uh, irritating chemical substance, and it spoils your complexion, so those art supports spoil the arches. And so that constant scrubbing of your teeth brushes away the enamel on your teeth and brushes away your gums. So all the artificial things that we employ help us to injure ourselves and rather than help us to maintain a normal state of the body. Here's a woman who's on overweight and uh, she puts on a dress and puts out in front and can't make it but she pulls it in the middle of the and then she goes down Now, it would be much better to take a little exercise. Or she gets a foundation garment that she can squeeze in. Now, those things are just they were modified corsets. Some of them still wear corsets. But exercise will develop the muscles of the waist and of the abdomen. And they'll hold you in position in a normal way. Whereas these things only make the muscles weaker and weaker. After you wear them a while, you take one off and your muscle, your abdomen sags more. And the longer you wear them, the more it sags because the weaker the supporting structures become. Those muscles are intended to hold in the abdomen. Now, they won't hold in the fat. The best way to get rid of that is to reduce. But it's better not to let it accumulate to start with. You know, fat kind of is a thing that grows on us. We may put on an ounce in a week. We don't notice it. Just an ounce. You can't see it. You can't feel it. You don't even notice it in the fit of your dress. The next week you put on another ounce. You still don't notice it. It just slowly slips up on you because you're eating too much, of course. All right, when you notice you've gotten four pounds overweight, that's the time to begin to reduce because you can get rid of that four pounds in two or three days. It's very easy, but you keep on eating, you keep neglecting it. I'm going to get rid of it. I'll do something about it. And you put it off, and you put it off, 
And someday, a fine day, you'll step up on the scales and wake up to the fact that you're 30 pounds overweight instead of four ounces. And now it's going to be a difficult task. Now it's going to take time. And how many of you have the willpower? How many of you have the self-control? How many of you have the determination that's going to be required to lose that 30 pounds? The most difficult people I have to deal with are fat men and women who come to me to reduce. They don't, they don't feel better. I'm not sick, I just want to reduce. Now if you're sick, you'll do something. If you're suffering, you want to get rid of your suffering. If you've got a gastric ulcer, and I've got a man there now, I just learned from somebody here in the audience uh, that knows him. Uh, that's getting along beautifully. His gastric ulcer is already healed. He's feeling fine. He wrote his friend who here. He says, something, something came over me. He said, I never had such a wonderful feeling in my life. He was fasting. It's free of his ulcer. But now he was willing to fast. He had 50, 15 years of medical abuse with uh, 15 years of suffering. Uh, at the time, he, he had reached that period where he was willing to do something sensible to get well. He didn't kick about fasting. Uh, after the first few days, every day, saw him, his pains getting less and less and less, and so finally he had no pains at all. Well, you'll do that if you're sick, but if you don't think you're sick, I'm just over it. And I do love to eat. That's the way you got fat to start with, you love to eat. <clears throat> if you weren't, if you didn't love to eat, and at the same time, if you had any regard for your parents, people who allow themselves to get fat are people who don't care how they appear. Most of us don't. We don't care. Anyhow, I can pull it in with a girdle here and hide it there with something else. And uh, nobody will see it except in my bedroom, and I can usually keep people out of my bedroom, so we let it go. So we reach that stage where we think, well, I'll reduce. And we don't do it. I remember once a woman came to me in New York and she said, I, I want to reduce. Well, I said, it's obvious that you need to be reduced. Uh, she says, I only want to lose so much. Forty pounds, I believe she wanted to lose. I said, you ought to lose about a hundred. I don't want to lose that much. I'd look too skinny. And that's another peculiarity about us. Uh, we've got, we have become so used to seeing ourselves fat that we think of ourselves if we were at a normal size as being too skinny. So I said, all right. I took her in hand and I cared for her until she lost her required amount, what she wanted to lose, and I let her go. About three months later, she came in and she said, well, Dr. Sheldon, you have to do your work all over again. And I said, why? Oh, you know how it is. She said, I like to eat. And so I said, but uh, why should I have to bother with you now? You, you've been through it once, you know how. She says, I won't do it unless I'm paying somebody to help me do it. So I said, okay, I need the money. <clears throat> so, so we brought her down to 40 pounds again, and I let her go again. But now, this is what the experience I have with these people. Either they won't go through it because it takes too much self-control because they have to be off that food that they love so well too long a time and they won't do it. Or else they'll go to a certain, they go up to a certain point and then they go back and they gain it all back. It's a very discouraging thing on my part to have to deal with them. But I have to deal with them because they need the services and I need the money. And none of them stay with me long enough that I ever get rich. So, <coughs> I... I had one little girl came down from New York. She was the wife of a sculptor. She was the original five by five. She was exactly five feet tall, and she weighed 400 pounds. She said, my husband borrowed money for me to come down here. And he told me that if I don't reduce this time, she'd been trying it for several years, not to come home. And I said, can you get, can you reduce me? I said, no, I can't, but you can. You can reduce if, if you follow my instructions. I'll give you six months, Dr. Sheldon. I said, six months? 
You need two years. I'll give you as much time as you need. You know, you can't lose that much weight. It's taken, she probably took 20 years to put it on and she wants to get it off in six months. You can't lose weight that fast. So, uh, anyhow, she gave me five days. She says, I can exercise at home. I said, of course you can, but you won't. And I don't want sun baths. Sun baths can help you take off weight. Fat people don't often do have trouble with sunbathing. She didn't want it. Fasting? No. She says, I like to eat. Well, I said, I know it. I can tell it. But this is, this is one of the problems of some of our ladies. They are overweight. And they allow themselves to get that way because they don't care how they look. Sometimes they wake up someday and they say, gee, I do look bad. Maybe I better get rid of some of this lard. And uh, they undertake it and they find it's not going to be a picnic and they give it up. A wo woman came to me once during the Depression. McFadden, or the Physical Culture magazine, McFadden was still with it at the time, offered a series of prizes to women for the best reducing program. Now to get it, you had to enter a reducing contest. You had a photograph made of yourself and you had yourself weighed and you had everything properly notarized so that they knew you weren't faking and you sent it in and you entered the contest and you had a certain period of time during which you yourself underwent a reducing program of your own that you worked out and at the end of that time you sent you kept made your reports uh, how much you were losing and so forth at the end of the time you sent in your reducing program and how much you had lost the first prize was five hundred dollars and this lady needed five hundred dollars very badly and she needed to re reduce very badly she was well overweight and she came up to me and she said I, I i haven't any money and i do want to reduce and i have entered that program could i work for you here and let you reduce me and i said yes so i put her to work and i gave her a reducing program and she stayed with it perhaps a week and she lost some weight but the, uh, the result of her efforts were that at the end of the period during which she was in this contest, she weighed more than when she started. In other words, she didn't carry out her program. She liked, she liked to eat too well. Then we have the other client, the women who are underweight. Now these are the real problem children because a woman is rarely underweight because she is not eating enough. Often they're eating two and three times as much food as they need. As, as a matter of fact, sometimes it seems the more they eat, the more they lose. It isn't, they're not underweight because of a lack of food. The only people I've ever seen that were underweight because of a lack of food outside of very sick people were people who had been on a long fast. But others were underweight in spite of the fact that they were overeating continuously. Eating all hours of the day and night and eating, eating so-called fattening foods. Our idea is to put, about putting on weight is that we want to put on some fat. We take a skinny, undeveloped or underdeveloped body and we think that if we can lay on enough layers of leaf lard, why well, that's all right, we'll get up to normal weight and we'll be normal individuals. But that isn't so because you, the, that lard does not, is not distributed over the body uniformly. It'll be in spots. You'll see a woman walk down the street and you can't see her, but you can see she's got on short skirts and you can see she's got nice skinny legs, very skinny. And from the hips up, she looks like, well, a young elephant. Or you can see her in the other way, great big legs that look like uh, they belong to a piano instead of a human being. And from the waist up, she's thin. You find this fat distributed over the body in various ways uh, so that they're all out of proportion. One of them has a great big front and uh, the arms are skinny. Or the arms may be very heavy and the legs skinny. It's just, so there's no beauty in that. And in laying on fat, if you're underweight and you lay on fat with the idea that you're going to get, attain a normal figure, 
then you just lay it on wherever you have a tendency to put it on, and the rest of the body remains skinny, and you still don't have a good feet. There's only one way to build a normal figure, and that is to develop that figure by exercise and proper nutrition. Those are the elements of good development. Now, the exercise program has to be arranged in such a way that it meets your particular needs. What part of your body is undeveloped and what part of the body is already developed? Your exercise has to take care of those undeveloped parts. So, but <coughs> this certain person that needs more than exercise, there is a failure to digest and assimilate food in these people. And there are causes for that failure. And that cause must be found out in each individual case because it may be one thing in one case and something else in another. It is necessary that we discover what the cause is and remove it and then put that person in a condition so that she can digest and assimilate her food. I, I once had a woman come to me. She was underweight and she had been underweight for years and she was suffering with headaches. And she said, I can't gain weight no matter what I eat nor how much. And I said, well now, I'm going to do something for you that's going to cause you to lose weight. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to put you on a fast. She said, well, that, that, uh, that doesn't seem reasonable. I said, well, sometimes a fast is the first step to gaining weight. I gave her a fast long enough for her to free of her headaches. Then I started, feed, started feeding her, and we didn't feed her a weight-gaining diet because that kind of a diet is usually a disease-building diet. We fed her a diet of fruits and vegetables with moderate quantities of starches and proteins. Within six weeks, the woman had actually gained enough weight that she was overweight. First time in her life she hadn't been skinny. And we started it with a fast. But that's what happens. When you, when you give the digestive system a rest, and when you free the person of the toxic condition, and when you rest the body so that the, you restore normal nerve energy, so that you have normal function, then the one who was not previously able to digest and assimilate food discovers that she is able to digest and assimilate food. Oh, but there's nothing wrong with me, doctor. I'm just underweight. I'm not sick. But you are sick, or you wouldn't be underweight. You are sick, or you'd be able to digest and assimilate your food. You don't have any pains. Maybe you don't have any discharges. Maybe you don't feel nervous. Or maybe you're not taking sleeping pills because you can't sleep at night. Maybe you're not sick in the accepted, commonly accepted sense of the term. But you're sick nonetheless if your digestion is impaired and your assimilation is poor. You're a sick person. And there's causes for that trouble. And these causes must be found and removed. And that's true of everything we deal with. Cause is the most important thing for us to think about. Cause is the most important thing for us to give our attention to. Whether it's underweight, overweight, sleeplessness, constipation, indigestion, or what it is, the first and most important consideration is what's causing this condition. Let's find the cause, let's remove it, and then, then let's build with, on a normal basis. Otherwise, we don't succeed. Now, is my time about up? No, and it's not as I wish. It's uh, well. I'm saying if it's about up, I'll get it uh, over. Yes, all right. That's what I want to know because I don't. I'm one of those speakers that doesn't like to monopolize the life of a people when I start talking to them. I, I think most of us talk too much. <clears throat> now, that's too much out of you. <laughs> Beauty is built. Now, let's get this in its true significance. You know the old saying, beauty is as beauty does. Well, now, that, ha that didn't have reference to what I'm going to say. Beauty is built on a beautiful life. And by a beautiful life in this particular, I mean a life that is lived in harmony with the laws of being. A life that consists of eating the right kind of foods under the right conditions, in the right combinations, 
and in the right amounts. That consists in getting proper exercise regularly. That consists in taking, getting plenty of outdoor life, of fresh air and of sunshine. And that consists in getting adequate quantity, adequate amounts of rest and sleep. That maintains poise of mind and cheerfulness of, of attitude. That, may, that, seek, that is at all times clean. Uh, be, in ref with reference now to bathing. A life that is lived in harmony with honesty and with truthfulness and with honor and dignity. And a life that is lived uh, helpfully, not one that is lived selfishly in an isolation. One that helps their fellow man. This kind of a life is the kind of a life that builds and maintains beauty. It's, it's something that is, it's the kind of a life that all of us can live, even if we were born ugly as a mud fence. We can at least live that kind of a life, and we can, by that means, have all the beauty that we are constitutionally capable of possessing, and we can maintain it for a long period of time. And we can have health, and health and beauty are so nearly synonymous that sometimes I think we ought to discard one term or the other and just use the one so we know what we're talking about. We can have health and strength and energy and endurance and happiness and usefulness right on into what we today think of as very advanced age. I, I read a story the other day about Hippocrates. I read it in, in uh, Wisdom magazine. Uh, and I think it was taken from the great book, from the introduction to Hippocrates in the great books. But at any rate, it tells us that he, had, he, di he died at a very advanced age. And I figured up his pro approximate birth date as they gave it and the date of his death. And he died uh, about 75 years. Now, that's not a great advanced age. <laughs> uh, I think that at 75, we should still be children. Uh, still running and romping in our in our shorts and enjoying life and this can be our lot if we will learn to live sanely hygienically there isn't any other sane life except the hygienic life I heard somebody say the other day there can be two truths well I think there are thousands of truths but I don't believe there can be opposing truths and anything anything that opposes any genuine truth must be false and there isn't anything that is opposed to the truths of hygiene that is, that is true. There can't be. There can only be one set of truths in this universe. There can't be two sets one, that are opposed to each other. You can have truths in hygiene. You can have truths in chemistry. You can have truths in any department of existence. But you find that they harmonize with each other. You don't find them to be antagonistic to each other. You don't find them to be, to be opposed to each other. All, all this universe of ours is based on a few fundamentals, all of which work harmoniously together. And it's true of the truths of life. It's true of everything that we should do. All of them, all the truths of life harmonize with each other. If you find something that doesn't harmonize with truth, then you can be, you better be suspicious of it. Either that or somebody's interpretation of it has been wrongly interpreted. So, let us spend our time, first of all, trying to find truth, following truth. Don't put your, don't actually don't put your beauty as your goal. That should be a byproduct of a life lived in harmony with truth. Beauty should be like pleasure in eating. It isn't pleasure that you eat for or you shouldn't. It's to nourish your body. Pleasure is incidental. So with beauty, it's a byproduct of truthful living. Let's learn the laws of life and stick to them and let beauty come as a byproduct of that living. That's the, that's the true hygienic way of life and that's the true beautiful way of life. And that'll give us all the beauty that we are capable of having based on what we were at conception. Thank you.
I will get started now. Uh, Dr. Shelton, could uh, one become a hygienist without uh, starting a fast? One may become a hygienist by, become, by just starting hygienic living. One does not always need a fast. Many people have sufficient uh, health that they can just begin hygienic living without first taking a fast. Fasting is really for those who are ill and who need fasting for cleansing purposes. Uh, I didn't become a hygienist by first taking a fast. I became, I, I told Mrs. Uh, uh, Oberhalter just now, she mentioned here yesterday that she still has the first copy of Physical Culture that she bought, that I bought the September issue of Physical Culture in August of 1911, and I still have that copy. I, I bought it one Saturday evening as I went, stopped at a newsstand on the way to the show, and I, I read it when I got home that evening after the show, and I began a program of exercise following Sunday morning, that is the next morning. And I didn't wait for a fast to begin. I began immediately to change my eating habits and other habits of life. You don't have to begin by a fast. Uh, what does one do when they have a very dry skin? Don't you use a lubricant of any kind? If you want to have a dry skin and keep a dry skin, use a lubricant. Because when you lubricate your skin from the outside, you learn to depend, your glands in your skin learns to depend upon that outside lubrication and your own oil glands do not secrete the necessary oil. Dry skin means poor nutrition. Proper nutrition will remedy that condition quickly. Uh, you advocate meat in your book. Does that mean you approve of meat? If I approved of meat, I would advocate it, and if I advocated, I approve of it, but I didn't do either. Uh, there is there is meat in one or two of the menus in the book on food combining made easy. If you turn to the introduction in the second paragraph of the first page, you will see the statement that as this book is written for the general public and not for the vegetarian only, I have included a few menus in here to show the meat eater how to combine his flesh. Uh, what other protein is there besides nuts? Everything you eat, unless it's been refined to the point where all the proteins have been taken out of it, like sugar, white sugar, everything you eat contains protein. Uh, there, take, for example, the dates, of which we're very fond. Dates contain about 2% protein. Uh, sometimes I see uh, avocados listed among the protein foods, and I've been guilty of it myself in the past, and actually avocados contain only about 1% protein. It's not proper to list them as proteins. They're, they're really fats. But there's protein in cereals, and there's protein in legumes, and there is protein in celery, and there is protein in all, in all of our green vegetables, and there's protein in uh, almost everything that we eat, including the nuts. There, we, class, we, we stress nuts because these are the high protein sources of plant protein. <clears throat> Please give principles which should guide humans in choosing life partners for most advantageous uh, results. Uh, universal errors would puzzle. Um, uh, it, it's, it's worse than a crossword puzzle. <laughs> However, in, in our present-day knowledge of Mendelian segregation, we have in our hands a means of uncrossing and uncrissing this crisscross. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever do it. It, it would be quite an undertaking, but it can be done. Uh, however, to undertake to discuss principles of selection uh, would take us rather far afield this evening, and it would take a lot of time. Uh, the the, uh, the primary rule is that we should that like should marry like, and that's true even within the race. Disparate breeding within the race is also ruinous to the race. 
And uh, I'll not make any effort to go into that in any great detail. I'm, I'm going to cover that in, in greater detail in this forthcoming book on the normal man. But I'm not going to try to go into great details of it this afternoon because we lack the time. Uh, you said drugs should not be used to kill pain. What about the last stages of cancer and so forth, when the pain is beyond endurance? My father was brought up in the old school. He believed in drugs. And when I began to break away from my faith in drugs and began to adopt what we now know as hygiene, uh, he was very bitterly opposed to it. When I came to Chicago to go to school, he went with me to the railway station and he Every step of the way from home to the railway station, he did his best to persuade me not to come here and waste my money studying something that wouldn't be of any value. Uh, he wanted me to study medicine, study law, study for the ministry, study business administration, study anything except that. You're just wasting your time and your money. Uh, during one summer, I got a place with a sanitarium in Elmhurst out here beyond the city a short distance. We had some asthma cases out there. And my father had asthma. And I wrote him and told him what we did to the cases and how they got along. And he didn't even bother to reply to my letter. <clears throat> uh, time came, however, when he was at my place and observed a few, for a short time what we were doing and the results we were getting. And then one day, I stopped in my home on my way back to my place from New York and I found my father in bed. And he said, can you do anything for me? And I said, if you follow instructions, he says, I'll do anything you say. I'm dying. I know it, my physicians know it. They tell me that I've got six months to live, that there's nothing more they can do, get cancer. I took him in my car and took him down to my place. And instead of dying in six months, he lived eight years. He lived eight years in comfort. He lived eight years, he enjoyed life. He lived eight years without pain. He died without suffering. He died of cancer. I never saw a case of cancer get well, no matter how you care for them. But I've seen a lot of cases of cancer have their life prolonged, and I've seen them live in comfort and in usefulness and carry on their work. My father carried on his work as a building contractor up to within 46 hours of his death. He was still planning his, day, his activities for the next day when he collapsed one evening. Uh, but he died free of pain. I have taken patients that were taking dope several times a day and night, and within 24 hours had them free of pain. I'm speaking of cancer patients. And I've carried them along for long periods of time without pain. They die of cancer. They don't get well. But they don't have to be dope. You don't have to make dope addicts out of cancer patients in order for them to endure their last days on earth. <clears throat> How long may I go on a fast on my own? Many people have taken long fasts on their own responsibility, and they've done it sometimes with very excellent results, and others have killed themselves. I don't advise you to take a long fast without proper supervision. Most people can afford to fast as much as two weeks without supervision. Older people, I would say, don't do it. I mean, people past 60 or 65 or something of that kind. Don't try to fast even that long without supervision. Uh, why do you advocate sour cream with bananas? Since your breakfast consists of only fruit, how many ounces do you think is about right? Don't say eat as much as you like. Surely you know what is about normal or average. <laughs> I don't advocate sour cream with bananas. I say that the combination is not bad. I, I don't eat sour cream with bananas. When I eat bananas, I like my bananas. I like the taste of the banana itself. And that's the best way to eat all fruits. Eat the fruit by itself and get every bit of the delicious taste out of it that you can. Enjoy your food. Don't worry about how much you eat. If you chew your food well and actually enjoy it, you aren't going to overeat. 
You people that could throw your food down by the shovels full and swallow it without chewing it and don't enjoy it, you're the ones who keep stuffing and stuffing and stuffing until you're overstuffed. Uh, my doctor tells me my gallbladder is bad and must be removed. He has me off fats and fried foods. He says I'll be able to eat normally after the operation. Would a raw food diet correct this? And if your head was bad, he'd want to remove that, wouldn't he? Chop off the corns, chop off the toe to cure corns and cut off the head to cure headaches. Uh, there's nothing like destroying an organ in order to remedy its trouble. Take out the tonsils if they're inflamed and remove the heart if you've got inflammation of the heart. Uh, that's the program that he offers you. Remove your gallbladder. Don't restore it to health. Remove it, and then you can eat normally. I wish you'd consult with a few of the people who've had their gallbladders removed and see if they can eat normally. <clears throat> now, by normal eating, he means conventional eating, which is the same kind of eating you've been doing all your life, which has helped to bring on the very trouble you've now got. In other words, he take out your organ and he's going to enable you to go on violating the laws of life for a little while longer. That's ridiculous. Now, will a raw food diet remedy your gall tr gallbladder trouble? I don't know whether it will or not. I don't know just what kind of gallbladder trouble you have, but I do know that if you've got gallbladder trouble, an operation will not remedy it. It'll destroy the gallbladder, but it'll not remedy your trouble. And even if you can't have gallbladder trouble anymore, like, just like the man, if you cut his head off, can never have another headache. Uh, so when you take out the gallbladder, you can never have gallbladder trouble again. But you haven't removed any causes, so you develop other trouble. Find and remove the cause of your trouble, whatever it is. And it, as your physician is not capable of doing it because he hasn't been trained to do that. He diagnoses disease. He, he, uh, he can listen to your heart, and he can make blood tests, and he can make urine tests, and he can... He can thump your chest, and he can look at your tonsils, and he can look into your ear and your nose, and he can do all of these things, and he's expert at it. And when he gets through, he can sum it all up and say, you've got one thing, and you go down the street to another doctor and have him do the same thing. He sums it all up and says, you've got something else. And you go to a third one, and he sums it all up, so he discovers you've got a third disease. I remember once a woman came to me, and she says, Dr. Shelton, I've been to 12 specialists and one osteopath, and I've got 13 diseases. So, so I said, well, have you come to me to get a 14th? Well, I'm not going to make a diagnosis, so I'm going to try to find the causes. And inasmuch as your physician's never been trained to search for causes, he doesn't know how. But that is the first point for first step in your recovery of your gallbladder troubles. Find out what's causing that gallbladder trouble and remove it. And it can be done. It can be found out and it can be removed. And you can be restored to sound health and have a good gallbladder to go along with it. Dr. Royal Lee has a theory that there is an anti-enzyme factor present in dried beans and that this factor may be eliminated from the beans and by, by discarding the water that the beans are soaked in and adding fresh water just before cooking. With soybeans, the, the water should be changed four times according to Dr. Lee. Would like to have your view on this anti-enzyme factor. Is it present in dried beans also? Dr. Lee, Dr. Lee might, might be correct. correct. There, may, there be may be such an anti-enzyme factor in beans and peas. I do not know. Uh, there, uh, there are, are in factors, factors in some foods that prevent, prevent the assimilation of other parts. For example, example in oats, it's long been known that there's an anti-calcium factor in oats, uh, so that it interferes with bone building. Uh, but, uh, but I would point out that in soaking beans, beans in water, water and throwing away the water, it isn't just the anti enzyme factor that you take out. You take out a lot of minerals and vitamins. And in the case of the soybeans, if you soak them two or three times and throw it away, these, all these things are bad enough to start with without making them worse by soaking them and throwing away the water in which you've soaked them. I would say eliminate the beans from your diet. have always been very thin above the waist and very heavy in hips. Will fasting correct this proportion? It'll get rid of the fat, but it won't, it won't increase your size above the hips. That'll have to be done by exercise. And when you start, after you've reduced, to get rid of a condition like, like this, you've actually got to get fast or, or reduce until you're underweight. Because uh, you don't, you don't get, get rid of all that, that fat until, until you do get, get underweight, and then you've got to eat very, very moderately and put on your weight slowly and do it cheaply by development rather than by laying on fat, because that, that's the portion of your body in which you lay on fat again if you get, if you get fat. fat.
You'll, you'll take, take it on, on right in the same places that you've now got it. You've got, you've got to, build to build up your body, body by developing it, not by laying on fat, fat in, order in order to have proper proportions. proportions. You'll get watermelon a good diet for a few days when constipated. Watermelon, watermelon is a good diet for a few days at any time, whether you're constipated or not. What watermelon does have a tendency to make you constipated. That, that shouldn't stop, stop you from eating a watermelon, watermelon just because you're constipated. And we ever eat homemade ice cream once in a while and still not be too much in error? Oh, I say twice a year. Uh, what can we do to pass on the work of hygiene to the people on the street? Can you give us any suggestions? First place, know what it is yourself. Make a sufficient study of it that you understand it so that you can present it properly. Second place, don't make a nuisance of yourself. Don't use it as a club. Don't beat people over the head with it. That, if you let your enthusiasm run away with you, you go out and you try to induce, you try to make a hygienist out of everybody you meet. And all you do is succeed in getting yourself dubbed a fanatic or a crank. Now, it's true enough, as old Dr. Morrall here in Evanston used to say, uh, one crank head can turn a hundred wheel heads. Uh, but uh, you find that most of these wheels are, are, don't work on her, on her pivot that will revolve. Uh, pass it on by suddenly finding out who will be ready to receive it. Because if you try to give it to somebody who isn't ready, they just won't accept it. As a matter of fact, he'll close his mind and say, I don't want to hear about it. You're, you're just a fanatic. You're crazy. You're a crank. He'll say to you, all oh, the medical profession has spent millions and years in research. They ought to know something. 